Thanks, Brother John, for that. If your Bible's open to Acts, Acts chapter 27, Acts chapter 27 tonight. If you would, please, we continue on from our message this morning and our theme for this year, which is I Believe God. You say that with me? I Believe God. Hopefully, that is not just words you say, but hopefully it's a way and a life you live. As we were planning, as I was planning and praying about the theme for this year, the Lord brought this passage to my mind and my heart, began to study and believe that's where God would have us go this year. I am not by most people's stretch of the imagination a pessimist. I am typically an optimist. And uh, I find that I am in a select group of people in that category. Now, most people do not claim to be pessimists, all right? But most people will say it this way, well, I'm, Pastor, a realist. Okay, let me define realist for you. It's real easy. Pessimist. Look it up. Later, not right now. But I'm typically an optimist. But as I, as I study this passage, I realize some things about this passage are kind of pessimistic. All right? And that's, that's harder for me because I don't view life that way. You can ask my family, ask my wife. Usually, uh, usually I, I can see the bright side. And some, not always, but usually you say, boy, this is wonderful. I remember a joke that I heard years and years ago where, where a, a father had a very optimistic son. And it seemed like everything that happened, he was just excited about. And so one day, being so irritated with his son, he said, I'm going to fix him for his birthday. He got him a barn full of horse manure. He said, surely this will, cure, uh, well, this will cure my son of being an optimist. When you know that someone out began to shovel. His father, perplexed, said, son, what are you doing? This is just a, a barn full of horsemen. He said, dad, with all this horsemen, I figured there must be a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> all right, and so that's kind of how I view life. But I look at this story, I look at this account, and I see some terrible, horrible things. Now, this morning, I shared an illustration about Arthur and the horrible, terrible, or terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. And then incorrectly call him Arthur. His name is actually Alexander, which one of our resident librarians corrected me after. I appreciate that very much. Um, but the question I, I pose for us this morning, tonight, this year is this. In 2020, whom, what, who will you choose to believe? The, the question is not really, will you believe God or Baal? Most of us can answer that question pretty quickly. No, we know that, that this Baal, this, this idol made out of a rock or a jade or a, or a stone or clay is obviously false. That's not really the battle that we face, but we often face the battle of whether to choose what I see or whether to choose what I hear or read. What will you believe in 2020? It's a choice that must be made for us to believe God as individuals, as families, and as a church, that we will choose to believe God. What will 2020 bring? Probably wonderful things, marvelous blessings. Will it be without trials? undoubtedly not. Undoubtedly, there will be some trials, but God is good. Can I get an amen? amen? I love that thing. God is good. Finished by this phrase, all the time. Do we really believe that, though? Oh, he's good at Christmas time. He's good when we get a bonus from work. He's, he's good when we get a promotion or a raise, but is he good when bills pile up? Is he good when things don't make sense? That's when our faith is questioned and our decision, our choice is challenged. I shared this this morning that this choice to believe God affects absolutely everything else in life. If I believe God, then I will raise my kids accordingly in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Yet we have many Christian families who don't raise their kids in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But I believe God. If I believe God, then I will pattern my finances accordingly as a steward. I desire to be found faithful before God, not a hoarder nor a spendthrift, but using the resources that God gave me to further his kingdom. Yet, does every Christian use their resources to further God's kingdom? Though we would claim to believe God, if, if I believe God, then I will live my life and pattern it after his way, acknowledge him in all my ways, trusting that he will direct my paths. Yet, too many of us pattern our lives after our own thoughts and plans and our own ideas and goals and dreams. Yet, I choose to believe God. If I believe God, then at work I'll apply myself to the best of my ability so that whatsoever my hand finds to do, I'll do it with all my might. Yet, Christians aren't always the best workers, are they? Yet I believe God. If I believe God, then no matter what circumstances come along my way, 
I will trust him by being careful in nothing but committing everything to prayer with thanksgiving. Yet, Christians, we can worry, can't we? We can worry with the best of them. We can self-worry all the way to the grave. Yet I challenge us this year as a church, as individuals, and as families to choose to believe God. We find the passage here in Acts chapter 27, in verse 21, but after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God. You say that with me, for I believe God. That it shall be even as it was told me, how be it, we must be cast upon a certain island. Lord, I thank you for this passage, for this thought, for this testimony of Paul. Lord, I pray that you'd help me tonight to articulate those thoughts and words that would be true to your word. Lord, our hearts would be challenged by the truth here that this year we would have a commitment to believe you. There's no way that any of us could know what this year holds, Lord, but we know that you know all things. Lord, we don't know the problems that we'll be facing, but we know that you are the master of any problem in our life. Lord, I pray you'd help us tonight to have an open heart and mind to your word and your truth by your spirit. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. I preached this morning on the verses 13 through 20. I will not re-preach the whole message, but just to give you a little bit of background, Paul is about 50 to 55 years old. He's on a boat, and this passage, I am told, is one of the clearest passages that speaks of how a ship handles storms in all of Greek writing from that time period. There was no writing outside of Acts chapter 27, not in Bible or classical literature. No other writing that talks about how a ship handles a storm better than this passage, according to Greek scholars and time period historians. Luke has given us phenomenal detail, but of that detail we find that there is a massive storm going on. There's a verse in here that talks about the name of the wind called Euroclidon, verse number 14. But I mentioned this morning in the beginning, uh, the middle of that verse, the Bible uses these two words, tempestuous wind, which was where we get our word typhoon from. And in the Greek language was the strongest word for a storm known at that time. This was no ordinary storm. This is no accidental storm. And this was not a small storm. This was not a little bit of rain or a little bit of wind. This was the storm of the century, the storm of all storms. And Luke is very clear, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that this was a storm. And it was a big storm. So much so that verse 15 tells us uh, that the ship was caught. It couldn't, couldn't go anywhere. It was caught. And then, it, and then the verse says, and we let her drive. All right, that is the ship, not a female passenger on the ship. I'm not even walking to that one, all right? It was a ship, and, and I talked about this morning being out of control. I'm driving on the highway today and did not realize that we're going to get a little bit of snow out there, right? I do not like being out of, out of control in a vehicle, driving or not driving. I can't imagine being on a ship and being at a point in a storm that the ship is so out of control that there's nothing, nothing they can do. They've tried at this point in the next few verses everything. Now they throw out everything that's extra and hold on for dear life. You ever feel that way in life? Hold on for dear life? There is nothing they can do. In fact, we get to verse number 20. At the end of the verse says that all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. There are times in our lives that we become hopeless. There are times that we face a problem that we think there is no hope. But, but what Luke has set up about Paul in this account was that quite physically, these sailors and these soldiers and this captain and Julius the centurion and these criminals realized that this storm was so bad that there's zero hope. They're not surviving. And that's the background 
for the choice that Paul made, the decision that he said to say, I believe God. I can't think of a better background. I'm glad it wasn't that Paul was eating supper and he was having a full meal and, and his bills were paid. And I believe God because we'd say, well, Paul, that's easy to believe God. Look, everything's taken care of. I'm glad it didn't happen when he, he's preaching to, to a group of thousands of people and they're all getting saved. And then Paul says, well, I believe God. We say, well, sure, Paul, obviously you believe God because look at the effect of your ministry. Wow, God's obviously blessing you. But here we have the background of a man who has served God. He's been now on, on three different missionary journeys. He's planted multiple churches. He's faced persecution, shipwrecked, stoning, beating, opposition. And in the midst of the storm, then he says, I believe God. How bad do you have it? We can have it bad. There's what they call first world and third world problems. Third world problems are considered problems that happen to a, a developing country. Corruption, poverty, war, hunger, education, safety. First world problems are problems that we face in a world that's been blessed. I've read some first world problems that people submitted that they faced and were, were legitimate problems they faced. They said, when your kids put dishes in the dishwasher before they unload it, now you have to play a game of which one is clean. It's a first world problem. When you run out of hot water for the shower because someone else took too long, first world problem. When you and your spouse can't agree on what temperature to keep the thermostat. When your phone battery dies before you get home from work to charge it, first world problem. When you're eating chips or someone next to you is eating chips so loudly that you can't hear the TV. Or probably the most disturbing first world problem when you order chicken nuggets from a drive through but they forget to give you sauce. <laughs> Yet you and I both know people who are faced with first world problems who blow their lid, who quit on life for first world problem. I'm done, that's it, I'm finished. I'm going to tell this McDonald's employee exactly what I think about them. They didn't give me the barbecue sauce I asked for. And here we have a background of Paul. He's not working with chicken nuggets. He's not working with a dying cell phone. He's working with a ship that is in such a storm that everyone on this ship realizes there's no hope. It was a petrifying disturbance, but tonight I want to bring our attention to these verses 21 through 26 where we have a promised deliverance. We have a promised deliverance, and we have one just as much as Paul did. He says to us, God says to us, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Someone said this, that God will never give you more than you can handle. Now, please don't say amen because it's a stupid phrase. All right, you can say amen to that. God will give you more than you can handle. He will just never give you more than he can handle. These guys were in a ship that was more than they could handle, and they were seasoned, seasoned sailors. This was not... Paul's first rodeo on a boat, and, and these, no doubt these soldiers had been on a boat before as well, but they were given more than they could handle, but not more than he can handle. I read this illustration. There was a pastor that came back from a missions trip. He came back completely full of faith and ready to set the world on fire with love for Christ. During his first service back at the church, he, he closed in prayer, and he, he joyfully prayed and wholeheartedly went into prayer he asked things like this. He said, this is his account. He said, I asked God to keep us hungry for him, to grow our faith and to keep us dependent on him through every situation. That's a good prayer. One that I could see us praying, right? You know, God, help us depend on you in 2020. Lord, grow our faith in 2020. Keep us hungry for you in 2020. He says, I ended by exhorting the church to do all that God would have them to do the coming week. He says this, and it felt good. You ever have those moments, those days? Get done praying, you're like, boy, I just nailed it. The Lord just used me. He said, I walked out of the pulpit and began talking with other members of the church, and I heard a distinct cry of pain. As a father, I knew immediately that the cry was coming from my own son. And I turned to see him clutching his right arm at the bottom of the stage in the auditorium of the church. He says, amazingly not, 15 minutes after I prayed this mighty prayer of faith, my son had fallen off the stage and broke his right arm. We took him to the ER, he says, continue to say, then learned that our insurance had mysteriously laughed and now we were 
to owe everything with no insurance. We had no coverage. He said that began a long three-month process of going back and forth between hospital insurance provider, trying to figure out what had happened and how we're going to cover these hospital bills, not to mention my own son's pain and frustration over being in a cast and having to cut his basketball season short and trying to understand in his eyes as a young boy why would God let this happen to him. Then he says this. He says when it was all said and done, his arm was healed just fine. The bills got covered. And through it all, God provided and sustained, and he answered my prayers that Sunday morning. He just did it by using, he says, my family and keeping us dependent on him through circumstances I could never have conjured up all on my own. You see, the choice is simple to believe God, but it has profound effects. And sometimes we pray, we challenge each other, we depend upon God. He'll be strong, he'll be good, God is good all the time. And then the storm hits. And it's a bad one. And it gets badder. But God is still gooder. You can quote that right there. <laughs> See, in this time there was a messenger. He says this, an angel of God appeared to him. You find that in... In verse, the, in verse number 23, he says the angel of God here was no doubt who showed up in Paul's, in Paul's vision. There was no confusion about who was speaking to Paul. As often there is not when God speaks to us, there is no confusion about who's speaking to us. When, when, when we're called to trust God, it's not the devil speaking to us. It's not even our own heart or own mind because it doesn't make any sense. But it is clearly God who speaks to us and calls us to, to trust God. Sometimes it's as we read God's word. Sometimes it's through a sermon. Sometimes it's through a spouse. Maybe the Holy Spirit lives in your house as well as mine. A messenger, a clear messenger. But the message was clear. Now I want you to notice something about this message that, that caught my attention. Because in verse 23, he says, For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, the next three words, Fear not, Paul. Now the question that, that I pose is, was Paul afraid for himself or for something else? I would argue and submit to you that Paul was not afraid for himself. If you're having a, if you hold your finger there, turn back to Acts chapter 23. In Acts 23, God speaks to Paul in verse 11. And it says, And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul. Notice the same Paul, the same guy we're talking about. For as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Paul had a promise four chapters earlier from the Lord that said, Paul, don't worry about it. You're going to Rome. Paul had not been to Rome yet. He was on his way to Rome. That's what verse number one of this passage tells us. And so Paul's going to Rome, but he's not there yet. So I don't think, I don't believe that Paul was afraid for himself. Paul, I believe, knew he was going to survive. He trusted God. He believed God. God said, you're going to Rome. He's going to Rome. So why did the angel of God tell him Fear not, Paul. Remember on that boat, there's 276 people. According to what we know so far, there's only one saved individual. His name is Paul. Of the remaining 275 people, a centurion's name was Julius. And we believe the captain's name was Articus. Beyond that, there are soldiers and, and terrible criminals. These criminals were the worst type. Paul was on the ship because he had appealed to Caesar. It was a very rare act, a very rare thing that happened, and, and usually the trials did not get to that point. It was not that someone could just claim it very quickly, and, and then they went to Caesar. So what, what the historians tell us, and what I, what I discovered, was that these criminals were going to Rome because they were convicted of very high-profile and terrible crimes. They're going to face judgment most likely by animal or by gladiator death. These were not your run-of-the-mill, oh, I stole a loaf of bread criminals. These were terrible criminals. And with these terrible criminals, they would not have put 
just novice soldiers. They would have put some seasoned individuals, and Julius being the, the centurion in charge, because if anyone escaped and the prisoners escaped or something happened to them, the Roman law was that it was a life for a life. So if you allowed someone to escape, then you would give your life for this prisoner, soldier or centurion or whatnot. It did not matter. So they took their job very seriously, and, and Paul here, I believe, is fearful, not for his own sake, because he knew he'd go to Rome, but for the sake of those 275 other passengers on this boat, who, if they had perished in the storm, souls would be lost for all eternity. That's why Paul says this. He says, be of good cheer. He says in verse 24, lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Verse 22 tells us this, though, that you're going to have to say goodbye to the ship. It struck me as I studied this passage that too often we worry more about the ship than the passengers. Paul was more worried about the passengers than the ship. He says, the ship's going to go down, gentlemen. The ship's going to be lost, but no one else will be lost. You see, sometimes we worry more about our job than our co-workers. That's the ship over the passengers. We, more, we worry more about the heat on our bus route than the, the bus riders. That's the ship over the passengers. We worry about our house than our spouse. That's the ship over the passengers. More about our bills than our own kids. That's the ship, not the passengers. And Paul said, he said, gentlemen, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer because you're going to lose the ship. Be of good cheer. This, this thing, your livelihood, all right, your, your livelihood, you sailors, it's going bye-bye. It's gone. It's going to be obliterated. It's going to be lost. But all of you will be okay. I mentioned this this morning. I want to bring it back to light one more time. When Paul said this, the storm was still raging around them. When Paul said this, they're still not driving the boat. When Paul said this, this typhoon, this typhoonicus, this Euryclidon storm was sweeping them over everywhere it wanted to go. And that's when Paul said, hey guys, be of good cheer. What would you realists say right then, you pessimists? Yeah, whatever, Paul. Uh, pa Paul, you can't say that. What do you know? You're not a sailor. You're right. But I know the master of the wind and the seas. His name is Jesus, and I serve him. You see, Paul, at this point, after the promised deliverance, made a personal decision, the same decision I'm asking us to make. In verse 25, I believe God, and that it shall be even as it was told me. Paul says, what I know is this, it'll happen just like it was told me. What I know is this, you can bank on it, you can count on it, you can build on it, you can depend on it, you can talk about it, because it will happen. So soldiers, sailors, centurion captain, look up. The sky is bright. Be of good cheer. Why was Paul so confident? Well, he'd seen God work before. Why was Paul so confident? Because he had made a decision years earlier to believe God. And this decision to believe God had been proven over and over and over and over again. He chose to believe God with what he'd done, with what he'd shown. He said this, verse 21, I love verse 21, where he says, Sirs, sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me. Let me translate that for you. Paul says, hey, told you so. That's in the Bible. So next time someone says, told you so, don't say, well, you can't say that. But, but here's the caveat. He can say, I told you so, because he was following God. All right, he can say, I told you so, because he listened to God. We can only say that when it's from God. Hey, you can trust God with your finances. It'll work out. Told you so. You can trust God with your family. It'll work out. Told you so. Right here. He said, I told you so. I think verse 23 gives us the key for these two things in this personal decision. 
first thing I see, the first key I see is this, a recognition of who he was. Verse 23, there's two little phrases. He says, for there stood by me this night the angel of God, this first phrase, whose I am. He recognized who he was. He was God's. That's who he was. He didn't own himself. He was bought with a price out of 1 Corinthians, who Paul also wrote before this chapter uh, was enacted. I written the letter, I believe, to, to, to Corinth. Uh, you're bought with a price, therefore, I can serve God with my body and my spirit, which are God's. I'm bought with a price. I'm not my own. Whose I am? Question, Christian, whose are you? Listen, I'm God's. I'm saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'll never spend a day in the devil's hell. I'm not my own. I'm his, recognizing who I am and who he was. Angel Lord stood before him. He said, that's right, God. You're the boss. He went on that, not only recognition, recognition of who he was, but recognition of who God is and who I serve. Who do you serve? The living God, the saving God, the most high God. A human body contains 10 to the 28th power atoms. That is, a one followed by 28 zeros. The universe, perhaps only 10th to the 20th power of stars. In light of that comparison, the human body could be more than a million times more complex than the universe as we know it. But understand that a, a cat, a cat has 10 to the 26th power of atoms. Less complex than us, but more complex than the universe. And according to isoscope studies, you're like, where are you going with this, Pastor Howell? 90% of our atoms are replaced annually. Every five years, 100% of our atoms turn over and become new atoms. Aren't you glad it doesn't hurt? Since 553, one hour ago, one trillion of your atoms, of your body, have been replaced. A trillion for each of us. If all the people on earth were to set counting at this rate of atom, atomic turnover in your body, each person would have to count 10 billion atoms per second just to keep up. And who's watching over all the atoms? The great physician who keeps the world together. And Jesus, who has saved us, we're kept in the Father's hand. Amen. Who do we serve? Oh, we serve a great God. Amen. If He can keep our bodies together, our atoms on a small level done, He can handle life, can't He? He can handle a bill. He can handle a sickness. He can handle a problem in your life. What is too big for Him? The obvious answer, nothing. Yet, too often, we act like the old Superman. The old series of Superman, the old original television series, would confidently posture himself with his fists on his hips, his chest pushed forward, his legs spread apart, and stare down the barrel of a gun. The old television series, they would fire the gun, and, and Superman would let the bullets bounce off his chest, stronger than a bullet. Yet I found this interesting tidbit. Yet then, often the would-be criminal would throw the gun at Superman, and he would duck. <laughs> don't hurt me with bullets, just don't hurt me with the gun. It is Christians who have access to the power of the Almighty God. We can handle any storm and a little gun tossed at us. Too often we duck, though. Oh, we'll trust God with our eternal security, our eternal salvation forever and ever and ever. And yet, when a small storm comes, we forget to choose to believe God. What's my challenge this year? Just say, I believe God. Amen. When? Every day. Amen. Well, what happens? Everything, good, bad, or ugly, I believe God. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for 
the example we have of Paul. Really, Lord, we just see your faithfulness. Lord, I pray and ask that you'd help us. Too often, in a trial or a test, we get sidetracked, our perspective shifts. And really, Lord, we must just again choose to believe you. Lord, I don't know what 2020 may hold, but I do know you're still good. You're still God. Lord, and you'll still help us. Just a moment, the piano will play. We'll stand to our feet. I'll we'll challenge you to commit to say once again, I believe God. I look at the life of Paul. This is not the first time he'd made this decision. But it's the one that's recorded for us. Maybe you've been saved a long time. But maybe you've never been in a storm like this before. Lord, help us to make the choice for you. In Jesus' name.